Hello everyone, and welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley with you as always. Road of the Patriarch, the finale of the Cell Swords trilogy, which is kind of sort of all jammed into the final four of the Legend of Drizzt series. So if you've been listening, you know that Promise of the Witch King was a real letdown for me. It was just essentially this basic dungeon crawl, fairly straightforward, nothing super exciting happening, and it, it just didn't seem to add anything to the characters. Road of the Patriarch is shocking in its attempted scope. I don't necessarily think that it succeeds all the way, but I absolutely love it for what it tries to do. So when Trary started out as this dark shadow of Drizzt, I only recently got that he's Artemis Entrary, Arch Enemy. I'm almost certain that had to be purposeful. It's so ridiculous and Salvatore loves his goofy name things. I'm sure that was purposeful, but Entrary has really come into a character of his own right. We saw him uh, in the Silent Blade just be full of apathy and uh, like killing with no reason or no interest. And then he kind of gained it back after he thought Drizzt was dead, but you can tell he's entering that fugue state again because he overcame that part of his life, but now he realizes he has no focus, no desire, no dreams, nothing. He's just existing. Jarl Axel, for whatever reason, seems to have taken him under his wing and is interested in furthering things. This is coming more and more full circle here. Road of the Patriarch is all about essentially Entreri getting his groove back. The way that he goes about this <laughs> is surprising, to say the least, to find in a fantasy novel, especially a Forgotten Realms one. It's essentially to uh, murder his father who allowed him to be molested as a child. You know, I honestly didn't think that we would deal with issues like this in a Realms book. I'm totally fine with them being here. It's a little strange how it comes about, like in the prologue it's kind of mentioned and it's like, wait, what, did I really read that? Or maybe the first couple of chapters, and then uh, nothing is dealt with it until the very end, but I absolutely love the way that it's dealt with. I mean, it's like the main murder happens off screen, and uh, it, nothing is exactly what it seems, and there's this great scene, maybe about 80% of the way through the book, basically just of a priest raping a woman, and it's done in a way where you don't really get how it interacts with the main plot at all, and it's only after time that it comes back. I honestly thought it just, we, we, we just would not come back to that scene, that it would just be a little standalone scene, because Salvatore does do a lot of little ancillary side stories at times, but no, it, it does come back. It plays in very much, though, to the kind of broader theme of the novel, which is, does might make right? In a way, this is kind of like... <laughs> I hesitate to say this because it sounds so ridiculous, but this is kind of like, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like just the most straightforward hack and slash uh, sort of piece of crap literature there is out there. I, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to denigrate any literature, but let's just say, oh, I know, remember those little D&D &D books that they published when third edition came out and the whole point was just to introduce you to them? So this is like the Death Ray or Cave of Skulls or whatever one of those names was meets Plato's The Republic. A huge portion of this plot rests upon what actually happened in that dungeon crawl in book two. And I gotta tell you, honestly, I think it works better not knowing, because I skimmed so much that I really don't didn't catch the details and I don't remember it. And I think it works better when you don't know, when you're trying to figure out who's telling the truth and who's trying to gain what by saying X killed Y before, after, or during the dragon attack, in this room, that room, etc, etc, etc. It works so much better that way. I would recommend anyone who's interested in reading these just skip Promise of the Witch King. Maybe go back and read it afterwards, uh, because, you know, and then you can find out the full story if you're really curious, but... Reading it in order, skipping Promise of the Witch King works better, I think. But yeah, th there's a great scene where essentially Entreri is just arguing with a man about um, his right to kingship. Jarl Axel and Entreri essentially start their own kingdom in this, or attempt to. There are so many things that are just kind of thrown out there. And as I say, th the basic idea is might makes right. What sort of power is a man given and what can he do with that in the world versus... What constitutes an abuse of power? If this person came about it rightly, and what is rightly, etc., etc. I mean, you know, every answer opens up a new question. And of course, this ties back in the end 
thematically to the idea of a parent essentially being a king over their child who is their vassal and a priest being a king to their flock. This is almost a book that works better as just an exploration of themes rather than a plot. The plot's all over the place. It's fun, but it's all over the place and doesn't necessarily reach any sort of conclusions. By the end of it, our characters are in a similar place where they were at the beginning, but they've gone through a ton of stuff. It's a really fascinating book. I had a great time with it. I highly recommend it, though you have to get through a lot to get here. Not that it's bad, necessarily. Uh, I mean, the earlier in Cherry stuff is pretty bad, but essentially if you start with the Driz section of the world, right around the Silent Blade, and read forward from there, I, I think you're going to be uh, pleased by most of what you read and really pleasantly surprised by this book. This book actually made me want to read some of Salvatore's stuff that isn't realms related simply because it's like oh like he's really trying to tackle larger themes here he's not going about this in a childish manner anymore not just because he's dealing with child abuse but simply because he's I think really found a way to tie his themes into a bigger package than he did at the beginning. You know, in the beginning it was kind of like, racism's bad and friends are good. You know, it, it, was, it was so like Care Bears. And now it's like, uh, y you know, how do you make your own place in the world? Does guilt necessitate this, et cetera, et cetera. I, it, it's all these larger themes that he's meditating on. And I, I enjoy it overall a lot more. Granted, Cell Sword stuff was written, I think, much later so we might kind of have to kick it into reverse here once we get back to like Sea of Swords and things like that. We'll see. But yeah, really, really love this book. Highly, highly recommend it. We finally get to move on to the year 1369. How exciting is that? We're almost to the 1370s when 3rd edition is going to kick in hardcore. But we're not quite there yet. 1369, Star of Kursra. Really shocked that I didn't like this. I swear I picked this up in the library uh, a few years back, read a little bit of it, and really, really liked it. But when I tried to read it this time, it just did not work for me at all. It's really overwritten. There were things... It kind of starts out with a, a few friends. It reminds me a lot of some JRPG that I played years ago, but there were a lot of points where it would kind of stop and explain to you why people were wearing what they were wearing and what that signified in the world, rather than, say have it brought up in dialogue or have it come about naturally etc etc it, it just it really felt overwritten and didn't work at all for me i have no idea what i read of clayton emery's that i really like now because i i remember the uh the netheril trilogy being excited about it because i thought oh clayton emery i like him and then i didn't like the netheril trilogy and now i've read this and i don't think he's written anything else for the realm, so I have no clue where I got the idea that I like Clayton Emery from. Apparently I just don't like him. I don't know. But hey, speaking of authors who I didn't like before, uh, and I'm giving a second chance to, and yay, I really, really, really like the newer stuff that I'm reading. Mel Odom, Autumn, coming back with the, uh, well, I can't remember the sea tril or the trilogy, but this this trilogy about the sea. First book, Rising Tide, and the second book, Under Fallen Stars. Really, really enjoyed this. Honestly, did not think I was going to enjoy this at all because the Sahagwin? I don't know how the hell you say that. Sahagwin? They aren't interesting to me at all. I remember I tried reading the Plague of Spells stuff when 4th edition first started because I was just curious to see what was going on there and that looked to be 4th ed. And uh, there's some Sahogun or whatever stuff in there and it really bored me. And I just, I don't know, I find undersea stuff a little silly because I always picture it going in slow motion. I don't know. But the way this starts out is just so epic and almost Lovecraftian with, uh, with our main um, Lenti uh, character going and finding this lost thing that is only spoken of in really, really esoteric texts of their people. The one who walks with Sekala, their lawful evil shark god whom they follow. Then uh, from there, it's like this, this creature who has this intense power over the Malenti and over basically everybody because of all the stuff that he can do, comes back to life and she's following him and it's it's his grand plan playing out. That's one third of the story. Second third is uh, our main character, our young hero. I don't know, I found him interesting. He gets a little annoying at times because he's just so like overly obsequious and really unlikable, but I liked the fact that he was unlikable in, inter in an interesting way, I thought. He wasn't your typical sort of Robert Jordan main character, 
but he also wasn't your typical really, really annoying main character done to kind of, you know, make a difference or whatever. He was somewhere middle of the road, and you really kind of uh, felt for him through his trials, and it's, I don't know, I, I don't want to say it's heartbreaking because it didn't work that much for me, but it's, it's kind of sad at points where, like, for instance, he gets this, I can't remember what it is, some sort of little token thing, like a coin or something, for the one who's destined to have it, and the priest who gives it to him knows that it's him, and he's just kind of like, well, I'll hold on to it until they really, f until they find the real chosen one, because obviously it's not me. And stuff like that just feels true. It rings true to me. The other, the last third of the story is following a, uh, a bard who's going to tell this tale into the future, and it's going to be this great song, and that's like predicted, and that's part of the cycle. Which I thought was a really interesting way to include a bard. It, it doesn't work in a great way in the story, simply because the bard has like jack to do with the main battles i mean he helps out during one of the big sahogwin attacks that's the one on waterdeep i think but for the most part he's just kind of off singing and learning songs and it feels like wow bards really are kind of useless huh um and i've played bards i like bards you know they're not frontliners but i i like them there are some drawbacks in this book some really frustrating things it really feels like mel autumn went through after he was done and was like man i say the name jarek who's our you know main character a few too many times so i'm gonna go back and just like crap what is it find and replace not control r control f i don't know whatever i'm gonna go find and replace about half of them with the young sailor like he uses that exact phrasing every single time that he decides to use something besides jarek and uh the main bad guy calls his malenti my little malenti that's his like name that he uses for her every single time he addresses her it gets so tiresome there's a paladin who shows up about i don't know halfway through book two and he starts calling jarek young warrior and it's like all of a sudden oh man it opens up like suddenly we have three things we could call jarek and that's great autumn seems to do this and he makes his characters do it which is strange on both accounts you know it's like i, I talked earlier about alias being called swordswoman every single time rather than say choosing another descriptive word for alias I don't mind if a person's name is used over and over again, if they're the main character especially. You know, it's nice to kind of mix it up sometimes, but to, to try to mix it up and just use one alternate phrase <laughs> is maybe not the way to go. I would advise against it, any of you fantasy writers out there. So I've only made it through the second book of the trilogy. Book two is a little weaker than the first, but it's the midpoint of a trilogy you kind of expect things to just be going towards build up here this really feels like one large book which is nice i really like that i really like the fact that it's not just three books sandwiched together and the second book is an entirely filler it just feels like the second act of a much larger story very curious to see where this will go a little frustrated that it's probably not going to be anywhere super exciting for the sahogun or whatever because it really feels like this guy who walks with sekala should have some world shaking events happening following him around and it's like uh this is probably just gonna like sink an island or you know some sort of small thing like that that'll probably feel epic in the book but just won't impact the world in any real way so that's a little frustrating but really good overall really digging the series so far here's hoping the third book is great we'll get to that fairly soon i hope haven't even started on it yet because it's a, a year or so down the road but i'm almost there all right it looks like next time we might actually finish off 1369 how exciting will that be sweet thank you all for being along for the ride hope you're enjoying it i know i am feel free to leave any comments any feedback any thoughts that you have love hearing it would love some video responses out there thanks everybody this is michael t bradley and you've been listening to realms remembered